You are very welcome to this video, and I'm particularly pleased to welcome Dr. Peter McCullough, who is uh, an internist, a cardiologist, an epidemiologist. He's been a professor and a very, very highly published doctor indeed. And, and I'm also welcoming uh, Nick uh, Holschler, uh, who is a medical researcher. Thank you, so, gentlemen. Thank you both for coming on. Thank you. Now, the basic thing we want to talk about today, and it's, it really couldn't be more important. I've got so many uh, questions I want to know about this, really. Uh, but we want to look at this paper, Autopsy Findings, Postmortem Findings, in Cases of Fatal COVID-19 Vaccine-Induced Myocarditis. So, so, Dr. McCullough, perhaps you could just start us off by you know, telling us a little bit about what myocarditis is and, and, and why you're concerned about it in this context, please. Well, myocarditis is a is a medical problem that we've dealt with in cardiology for decades, as long as I can remember. And uh, you know, prior to COVID, the causes uh, were Coxsackie virus, adenovirus, uh, occasionally an influenza virus, um, and then a, an idiopathic form called giant cell myocarditis. Giant cell was always the most worrisome. And uh, I'm in Dallas, Texas, and uh, Dallas, Texas led one of the most important clinical trials in myocarditis years ago. It's called the Myocarditis Treatment Trial. And uh, there, every single patient had a biopsy done of the heart to try to diagnose, uh, you know, exactly what was the cause of myocarditis. And what we learned from the study is that broadly applied steroids uh, didn't play a, a role and the most lethal form was indeed this giant cell, which is special histopathology. Giant cell, in fact, is so important to diagnose that um, uh, you know we quickly moved towards transplant um, and advanced circulatory support. But prior to the pandemic, myocarditis occurred at a rate of you know somewhere around four cases per million per year. So in the United States, that means maybe about 1,200 cases in the entire country per year. Prior to the pandemic, I had only seen two in my entire practice. One sadly uh, passed away. Um, but uh, so we rarely encountered it. Let me tell you something else. Prior to the pandemic, we had uh, guidelines written in cardiology that it was so well known in myocarditis that exercise or the surge of adrenaline could be a trigger for cardiac arrest we immediately took people with myocarditis out of sports or athletic competition. That's actually in all the guidance. So we knew myocarditis, if it exists, uh, could be fatal, uh, largely during two times, one during exercise, and then also in the waking hours, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. in sleep, because again, there's a surge of adrenaline during the normal waking process. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what was it motivated you to write this paper looking specifically at COVID-19 vaccines, because surely we've had a pandemic. Isn't that going to account for these cases of myocarditis, the viral infection itself? You know, there was a great concern. Ralph Barrick published actually in the journal that I was the senior associate editor of for many years, American Journal of Cardiology. He published back in the 1990s that human beta coronaviruses uh, could actually cause myocarditis in animal models if actually the animals were exposed to enough of it. He literally flooded the animals with the beta coronavirus could mm. cause some myocarditis. So during 2020, there was a, an incredible search for myocarditis. Uh, there were studies in the U.S. military, the Israeli military, and the most notable one is published by Daniels and colleagues, uh, and it was published in JAMA from the Big Ten Athletic League. Now, Nick is at the University of Michigan. They're in the Big Ten League. That's where I went to graduate school. And let me tell you what, they evaluated every athlete. They had 30% of the students uh, in 2020 got COVID-19 so, because they checked everybody. Mm. And they searched thousands of athletes to see if they developed myocarditis. And we're talking EKGs, blood testing for troponin, escalating imaging up to cardiac MRI. Out of thousands of uh, of possibilities of people who got sick with COVID, they came up with about 36 putative cases where there was some abnormality by, uh, by enzymes, uh, troponin, or by imaging. And you know what? Not a single hospitalization or death. Two Valley and colleagues in Israel found no increase in myocarditis during 2020 above the baseline rare cases. Mm -hmm. But what happened was a false narrative came out of the hospitalized literature 
where people sick enough to be hospitalized with COVID were having elevations in cardiac troponin in the ICU, as would patients with pneumococcal or haemophilus or other forms of, of pneumonia or ICU illness. None of those hospitalized cases were ever adjudicated to actually have myocarditis, but it was the elevation of troponin. So what came out of this was a false talking point that was carried forward by the American College of Cardiology and the government agencies that said that COVID itself causes more myocarditis than the vaccines, and nothing could be further from the truth. My thinking is that with the vaccine, the amount of spike protein produced is is unpredictable. So with the infection, you're going to get you're going to get the virus. You're going to get a certain amount of spike protein. You're going to develop an immune response, and that's going to be dampened down reasonably quickly. But with the vaccine, who knows how much spike protein is going to be produced? Because you're going to get systemic absorption. You could get spike, huge amount of spike protein developing all around the body, including in the myocardium. Is that part of the pathogenesis, do you think? I think so. Bruce Patterson at Incel DX has several peer-reviewed publications. With the infection, even severe cases, he's able to find only the S1 segment of the spike protein. Presumably, the S2 segment is sacrificed at the ACE2 receptor, and it has largely receptor-mediated um, catabolism. But there is the S1 segment that's found in the human body. With the, uh, with the vaccines, the messenger RNA and adenoviral DNA vaccines, there's a full-length spike protein. Even with the Novavax, it's a full-length spike protein, S1 and S2. That's been demonstrated by Brogna and colleagues in Germany. But more importantly, the quantity, which you pointed out, and the only way we can really uh, infer that is by the antibody rises. So the antibody rises to the spike protein in the natural infection are just a fraction of what we see with vaccination. Mm-hmm. Nick, how did you go about collecting the uh, the data for this and the, the the patients? How were they selected? So, so we set out to search the peer reviewed literature for all the published autopsy studies that include uh, cases with COVID nineteen vaccines as a previous exposure, um, and specifically those that that were affected by myocarditis. And so we found around uh, over a thousand studies we looked through and. Uh, we, we searched through those, and in the end, we came up with 28 cases. Um, and, and among these 28 cases, 26 of them, there were, only the cardiovascular system was involved. In two of these cases, uh, it, it was a consequence of multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Mm. Uh, and, and we could talk about how, how, how the mechanisms be- behind the, how those are differentiated. Uh, I mean, with multi-system inflammatory syndrome, uh, it, it, it's possibly due to that system, systematic uh, circulation of spike protein uh, that, that we've seen in a few studies. Um, now, also, one concerning finding we had was that the mean age of death uh, was 44 years old. Now, that, that's actually uh, that's a bit inflated because we didn't include... Uh, we didn't include the study by Gill, which was two teenage boys died in their sleep. We didn't include that study. We didn't include those ages and the descriptive statistics because they just said teenage. They didn't say the age. They didn't say so, so we didn't include the uh, any estimated age estimate. So if if we did, if we included uh, teenage, which was probably like 15, 14 years old, uh, the mean age of death among cases would be probably around. 30 years old and that, that's really concerning because you know th- these aren't uh, these aren't 90 year olds on their deathbed with with uh, five comorbidities uh, so so yeah and, and most of the cases died within a week of vaccination so that that established the temporality mm-hmm. of that mm-hmm. so you're careful to exclude studies where the cause of death might have been something else you're fairly sure that the 28 cases you've got were very likely to be vaccine-associated myocarditis deaths. Yeah, that's correct. And, and actually, in, in, a, in most of the cases, around uh, 18 cases, uh, there was the, the patients had no symptoms uh, prior to death. They, they just died suddenly at home. Uh, there, there was nothing suspected wrong. Uh, they just died shortly after vaccination. And, and the autopsy findings uh, presented uh, interesting findings that that, that uh, 
Nothing, nothing else likely causes this. Dr. McCullough, medically, how can it be that someone can be perfectly healthy one minute, no symptoms, sometimes no symptoms at all, and yet, yet be dead a few minutes later? I mean, what is going on here? We have some clues. Uh, one, uh, there are two prospective cohort studies that evaluated people before the vaccine and then after. One is by Mansugian and colleagues from Thailand, and that was on shot number two, ages 13 to 18. And in that study, it was uh, roughly 2.3% actually met a, a definition of myocarditis. Uh, a couple of the kids were hospitalized. And then a, a paper by Buren and colleagues from Basel, these were largely healthcare workers, mainly, mainly female nurses, on shot number three. And they just evaluated troponin alone, the main cardiac biomarker, and they found 2.8% had uh, an elevation in troponin after the shot. So, and, and there may have been one or two cases where they would have met a, a definition of myocarditis. So we're talking about 2.5% of people actually probably do sustain some heart damage mm. from these studies. And of those, over half are completely asymptomatic from a cardiac perspective. So, and there were two papers by Jenna Schauer in the journal Pediatrics that caught my attention. She was uh, recording children who developed myocarditis and a large fraction had no specific cardiac symptoms. They had a sore arm, they had fever, but nothing that would localize to the heart. And in uh, our paper uh, that you know, I published with Nick Hulsher at the University of Michigan, uh, what we found is that no one had an MRI ahead of time to diagnose this ahead of time. So th these cases turned out to be, you know, largely cardiac arrest and then the, then the finding of myocarditis at autopsy. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible that you could have two patients with the same degree of post-vaccine myocarditis and one takes it easy and maybe does a bit of academic work for a few days, but one decides to play a game of football or go for a run? And because of the exercise, it's quite possible that one could go into a, like something like a ventricular fibrillation, cardiac arrest, and, and the other might, as it were, get away with it. Is, is, is that element of ju just sheer probability uh, and bad luck in that, do you think, sometimes? It, it changes the probabilities. Remember, exercise is the surge of adrenaline, exercise shifts. There, there's one paper from Thailand that caught my attention by Itawit and colleagues that found that polymorphisms in the SCN5A sodium channel were associated with cardiac arrest in the setting of vaccine myocarditis. Genetic variability, really. Yes. So there could be genetic variability. And also uh, papers that we find that the myocarditis is very patchy. Uh, it's not very extensive. Uh, it's typically not enough to cause heart failure. Just as a general uh, rule, it would take about 15% of the myocardium that we would see on MRI by late gadolinium enhancement or would see by histopathology, 15% of the left ventricle before there would be left ventricular dysfunction. In autopsies that we had reviewed, there was small patches of inflammation, but here's the concept. As the myocardium is depolarizing, if the, the wavefront of depolarization goes through an area where there is inflammation and edema, there is slowed conduction and an opportunity for that wavefront to circle back and then cause re-entry. And when there's re-entry, that is the most common mechanism for ventricular tachycardia. And in a young person, the ventricular tachycardia is going to be fast. Many times it's going to cause a pre-syncable or syncable uh, symptoms and then will quickly degenerate to ventricular fibrillation because the VT is so fast. And that looks to me like what we're seeing on these athletes, particularly those in Europe who die on the pitch. Mm -hmm. And I suppose if you had a, an area of uh, inflammation in the ventricular myocardium as well, that, that itself could be a, a possible source of ectopic foci. It, it can. It could be ectopic foci, but it's, it's unlikely to be primary VF. The most okay. likely mechanism is initially ventricular tachycardia right. with rapid degradation to ventricular fibrillation. Mm -hmm. And recently we've been made aware of a paper from Japan where exactly they caught that. So there was a young Japanese man. Uh, the first author of this paper is um, uh, uh, Minato. And a young man is on the second, sec day after he takes Pfizer, he gets a fever, he collapses. 
and the paramedics uh, retrieve him and he's in a fast ventricular tachycardia, degenerates to ventricular fibrillation. So they've actually caught the entire episode. Now, uh, another factor to consider in these fatal cases, like the Monado case and another case by Choi, is involvement of the conduction system. So if the inflammation mm -hmm. involves the conduction system, we're talking the AV node, the bundle of his, the right and left bundle, then it's far more likely to be fatal. Choi basically you know, recorded a man who, who literally died seven hours into the hospital, and when they did the autopsy, the entire conduction system was t destroyed with vaccine-induced myocarditis. Wow, incredible, yeah. Um, now, it's staggering. I'm reading in this paper about 70% of the world's population have had uh, one, at least one COVID vaccine. And look, looking back, the incredulity is just huge that this could be done without proper cardiac uh, studies. A lot of people in my comments are really concerned that there's an epidemic of heart failure and other heart pathologies, but probably particularly heart failure, or increased cardiac arrests or increased coronary arterial atherosclerosis uh, coming. Um, is the are these fears in any way justified? I think they are, but 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 COVID, the respiratory illness and the vaccines need to be factored in. And and important citations. One is by Z and colleagues from the U.S. Veterans Administration, clearly demonstrating after COVID, respiratory illness. There's about a six week period where older individuals are at increased risk for myocardial infarction, stroke, and cardiovascular death. Mm -hmm. So it's a post-viral risk, probably related to you know, atherosclerotic inflammation. By the way, very similar pattern after influenza. Same type okay. of pattern. So it's, it's true. Now, with the vaccines, we're seeing this pattern of these vaccines uh, and then cardiac arrest. Uh, the vaccines, there's about 800 papers in the peer-reviewed literature, you know, implicating the vaccines with myocarditis. Our, our agencies came out pretty quickly uh, in 2021 and said the vaccines cause myocarditis. US FDA did. I know, believe it or not, in the UK and Australia, they came out pretty quickly with guidelines on how to diagnose vaccine-induced myocarditis. What's incredible, what's really incredible though, is, is after our agencies told us that the vaccines cause myocarditis, and we know with myocarditis, athletes cannot exercise, then the athletic leagues, many of them, including the U.S. NFL and others, they mandated the vaccines mm. with no safety. It's interesting. So during COVID, the respiratory illness, there was lots of safety. There was myocarditis screening programs going on. Nobody could find you know, basically any significant cases. But when the vaccines come out and the agencies say they cause myocarditis, then suddenly there's no safety screening or any other you know, measures. The athletes take the vaccine and then we see what happens. And it's quite possible that many of these cardiac arrests that have been so well publicized are caused by this. And if these people had been advised that there was an element of risk here and to rest for a period of time after the vaccine, it's not inconceivable that these deaths could have been prevented. That's true. But I tell you, the case that comes to my attention is Oscar Cabrera Adamas. Adamas is a Dominican player. He's playing in the, the Spanish leagues doesn't want to take the vaccines. He, he tweets this out. He's forced to take it in 2021. He has a cardiac arrest on the court. It's, it's filmed. He gets CPR. He gets defibrillation. He survives. He appropriately, you know, is taken out of competition. He's, you know, supposedly treated, apparently treated, and he's trying to return to competition. And it's now two years later in 2023, and he dies on a medical stress test dies on a medical, and I supervise wow. stress tests as a cardiologist. I've never had a death. I mean, we've had VT, we've even had VF, but we can always uh, shock and resuscitate. And so the Adamas case of myocarditis from the vaccine in 2021 and cardiac arrest in 2023 does give us great concern that uh, there could be inflammation or scar formation and then this stochastic risk later on in life of cardiac arrest. Mm-hmm. So if the vaccine had caused some physical scarring in the heart and we know that the myocytes don't efficiently regenerate, that scarring could be there forever and could cause problems uh, years or even decades down the line. It could. And, you know, it may not be detectable by MRI or even autopsy because they can be very small patches. Very small, yeah. 
And then we also have this uh, report that's so interesting by Nakahara and colleagues regarding abnormalities in card cardiac positron emission tomography. There are about 700 vaccinated, 300 uh, va uh, unvaccinated, getting PET scans for other reasons, but they had very good cardiac imaging. And it was striking where virtually every vaccinated person, uh, the myocardium shifted from preferring free fatty acids to preferring glucose as a mm. metabolic substrate. Mm. Uh, and it's tagged with 18 fluorodeoxyglucose. Now, when I order a cardiac PET in practice, I'm looking for an ischemic zone of myocardium. Mm. Here, the entire left ventricle actually t t took on, in almost every vaccinated person, the appearance of an ischemic left ventricle, whereas those unvaccinated had normal PET scans, no FDG uptake. And I looked at the paper carefully. And the only thing that makes sense to me, Dr. Campbell, is that there may be microthrombi or just, you, you know, RBC uh, uh, hemagglutination, which is well described with the spike protein, and in the small capillaries of the heart to create these metabolic changes. So, I, I, and this was seen even out to six months after the vaccine. So yeah. we have to posit that it may not be all myocarditis. It may be a form of a metabolic cardiomyopathy mm -hmm. or other abnormalities but it appears to be common, and, and we may just be seeing the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. Now, most of the deaths in this study, I believe, occurred uh, three to six days. Th th I think three days was the, uh, the, the medium and six days was the mean. Was that right, Nick? The deaths were shortly after? Uh, <clears throat> yes, yeah, th three was the median, uh, six, 6 6.2, I believe, was the Yeah, mean. okay. So d does that mean that the rate of deaths is, go is going to go down quite dramatically as as time increases from from the vaccine in terms of these sudden cardiac deaths? Yeah, we don't know, Dr. Campbell. It may be selection bias, meaning mm. the deaths that occurred relatively close to the vaccine it came to the attention of the family and the medical examiners, and that you know a death that occurred six or nine months later, no one may connect it, and it, it actually yeah. may not come to autopsy. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the things I found really convincing about this paper was the uh, the, the microscopy. So here we have evidence of uh, the spike protein in cardiac tissue. Uh, Dr. McCullough, what, what are we looking at here, please? And what are these red blotches? But, the, you know, these are um, uh, basically uh, histopathologic sections of the myocardium. Now, this is from a paper by, from Germany by Bohmeyer and colleagues. Now, these are young people with myocarditis in German hospitals who are actually surviving myocarditis here. These are mm. survivors, but we use this uh, image to show you the red staining is actually the spike protein. Wow. And, uh, and now in a recent paper by Crossan and colleagues, they've also demonstrated messenger RNA in the myocardium by uh, a genetic uh, identification technique. So I anticipate that there's messenger RNA right in the myocardium producing the spike protein right there, and we're seeing these red stains as a result. Mm. And what do we know about these patients' previous medical history? I mean, do we know if they've had COVID? Is there a differential diagnosis here between COVID infection and uh, vaccine-induced spike protein? Uh, in our series, uh, th there is actually... None, none tested positive for the COVID nineteen virus, uh, at least at the time of death. So we, we can, so the, the balance of probability is that this spike protein is is vaccine induced. Yeah, yeah, yep. And the the the, the blue there, that that they're, they're all cardiac muscle cells, Doctor McCullough. Yeah, they, that's yeah. cardiac muscle cells. And there's one more paper to quote. I want to make sure this is please. Uh, um, there is a paper of. COVID deaths, where people have died of COVID and they had an autopsy. Mm -hmm. And of interest, the hearts were examined in COVID deaths, not a single case of myocarditis or evidence of myocarditis with COVID alone. So mm -hmm. I think this is pretty important. We can get to the citation on this. So uh, mm -hmm. this is these are interesting observations. It appears as if COVID-19 illness, SARS-CoV-2 infection, actually doesn't cause serious myocarditis, despite all the concerns in 2020. But the big threat is COVID-19 vaccination. Mm -hmm. And also, um, th these are just the, uh, the blown up views of those pictures. Mm -hmm. um, but um, also the uh, inflammatory cardiomyopathy, the inflammation of the heart muscle is shown here with CD4, which at uh, T helper cells. Uh, 
Um, so I'm assuming that the blue here again are the cardiac myocytes, the, the heart muscle. Mm -hmm. And the red here is this the staining of the uh, lymphocytes, the, the T yeah. helper cells. Right, the red and actually the little dark uh, dots now. Um, oh, yeah. The, the dark dots that are not, you know, clearly nuclei of the cardiomyocytes. These are inflammatory cells. Uh, now, the important point here is, is don't forget CD4. You mentioned T helper cells that they they are actually in the business of trying to present antigens to B cells and then B cells mm. transform to plasma cells and produce uh, antibodies. So these this is a natural inflammatory response to a foreign protein in the heart. The foreign protein is the spike protein. Inflammation in the heart should not occur. And anytime there's inflammation, there is an opportunity for heterogeneous conduction through this zone. And anytime we have that, there's a risk for arrhythmias. I think there's a much bigger risk of arrhythmias than there is for heart failure. I've only had in my practice, I've only seen two cases of vaccine-induced heart failure. Mm -hmm. One man previously had heart failure. He had an ICDN prior bypass surgery. He took one dose of Pfizer and he went into cardiogenic shock and within eight hours was on um, mechanical ventilator, um, ECMO support, needed a heart transplant. It was a very clear-cut case. And then recently I saw a case where a man took a total of three shots, and after the third shot, he went into heart failure with a low ejection fraction. Uh, and it's probably missed myocarditis. But uh, most of what I'm seeing in the literature is just like this. The, these are boys with chest pain, no heart failure, but they're at risk for cardiac arrest. So I suppose we should be grateful that it's affecting small areas of the myocardium rather than large areas of the myocardium. But you've already pointed out the severe risks associated even with very small areas of the myocardium. Now, some, some cardiologists think that the vaccine can induce inflammation in the coronary arteries, accelerating the furring up of these arteries, accelerating the development of the coronary arterial atherosclerosis. Well, what's your thinking on that, please? I published a paper from our group in Dallas. Zhang was the first author. And we think the culprit there is the spike protein. The spike mm. protein clearly injures endothelial cells. It clearly causes hemagglutination. Recent paper from David Scheim, a former NIH researcher, has shown that unequivocally. And that it actually induces thrombosis. So I think the spike protein uh, is playing a role in episodic atherosclerotic events in people with atherosclerosis. Uh, as well as uh, ischemic stroke and other uh, atherosclerotic events. Do you think it could actually increase the deposition of atheroma, or is it more the blood clotting associated with the atheroma? No, I think plaque rupture is clearly in play. The Zhang paper suggested mm. that. And the other issue regarding the endothelial damage and these episodic events, it's my clinical impression that the risks are relatively equal for COVID infection and the vaccine. Now, we've got some sort of, uh, there's a model here that you've basically uh, sketched out, which I, I did find remarkably useful. Do you want to sort of just um, to tell us what the main parts of this model are, please, Dr. McCullough? We tried to piece this together clinically, what's going on. So we start in the upper left-hand corner and say, listen, people take an injection. It's now known that there's biodistribution throughout the body, crossing and colleagues showing messenger RNA in human myocardium. Bowmeyer, the slides we reviewed, shows spike protein from the messenger RNA is physically in the heart. So th there's, I don't think there's any debate here that the vaccine does go to the heart. Spike protein is produced. The heart may actually preferentially take up messenger RNA because myocardial blood flow increases during exertion. And this may preferentially affect athletes. Myocardial blood flow can increase roughly two to four times with exertion, people working out. Mm -hmm. um, the risk factors for myocarditis are interesting. It's, it's men, uh, peak ages 18 to 94, 90% of cases are men. And that was true before COVID and the pandemic. Myocarditis is always much higher in men than women, uh, boys greater than girls. And it must be related in some way to androgen, re, you know, receptors or other factors. No one actually knows. The genetic predisposition, I put this down there, the SCN5A mutation um, uh, has been described by Itowit. Hot lots, meaning some lots, have a much greater 
uh, risk of serious adverse events. That's mm. been described by Schmeling and colleagues. Cumulative spike protein exposure may play a role. There's a, enough cases now where people develop it on the third, fourth, fifth, even sixth shot. There's a fatal mm. case of an older man recently on the sixth shot. Pericyte uptake of messenger RNA has been demonstrated by uh, Avolio and colleagues. The symptoms are about over half, according to the two papers I quoted, have fewer or no symptoms. So they actually don't know that mm -hmm. they're having heart damage. 43% symptomatic with chest pain, effort intolerance, palpitations, near syncope, passing out, fever, malaise. Those come to attention. Uh, there's our diagnosis down the middle. We, If they're hospitalized, EKG, you know, I measure troponin, BNP, mm -hmm. ST2, galactin-3. Those are our markers since 2013. Those are our markers in the ACCHA guidelines. We monitor for cardiac arrhythmias, standard of care, image for LV dysfunction by echo, and then cardiac MRI. And then when we see a large area, in this case, a large area of late gadolinium enhancement, look where it is, Dr. Campbell. It's in typically the lateral wall and the outer part of the lateral wall almost mm. every time. It's interesting and mm. it's contiguous with the pericardium. So probably the best term to use is a myopericarditis. In almost all of these cases, the pericardium is involved. Uh, if we detect it, there should be no exercise. We have medications for LV dysfunction. A standard of care in my practice now is we have found, and the Japanese have reported this, good use of corticosteroids. So we use prednisone over the course of three months, colchicine mandatory for a year, non anti-inflammatories additionally for pain. If there's left ventricular dysfunction, we use evidence-based beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and the appropriate drugs. Large areas of late gadolinium enhancement, like this one shown on MRI, more than 15% of the ventricle, may need an ICD. Because otherwise, what will happen is, up top, there is the rapid ventricular tachycardia. And what you're seeing at the top or right is VT that's rapid enough that would cause someone to pass out on the playing field. And if not properly defibrillated, it generates to the rhythm below that ventricular fibrillation. Next is asystole. And that's what we're terming sudden adult death syndrome. Uh, you know, we do think this could explain the large number of deaths in people after vaccination with no other explanation. But clinically, when someone went into that ventricular tachycardia on the top, they would faint. Yes. And they would remain unconscious while they went into this ventricular fibrillation that would become finer and finer until eventually we just had a an asystolic line and no possibility of uh, resuscitation at that stage. Right. But if you notice the fainting, notice some of the athletes, particularly you can see this in the uh, soccer players, you call them football players, the soccer players in Europe, where you get to, you can see their body when they do hit the turf, there it typically is some convulsive action. You'll see some legs, convulsive action a little bit. That's actually a ventricular tachycardia. There is a little bit of perfusion to the brain. The brain is getting anoxic. And then once it's ventricular fibrillation, it's they're completely flaccid. Mm -hmm. And do we know that if this form of ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia, is this as amenable to defibrillation as, say, myocardial infarction-induced uh, VT or, or um, uh, VF? Uh, there's a paper by uh, Polly Cretas as first author, I'm senior author, where we, we analyze this from the best we could uh, detect in, in about a thousand European athletes. And the answer is yes, it's amenable to defibrillation. Mm. Uh, in our analysis, about 40 cases could actually be resuscitated on the field. And this is with without paramedics being there. There's coaches and other people. So if we get the defibrillator pads on, this can be uh, defibrillated. Um, I've uh, interviewed personally and examined Pilot Snow in the United States. He had a vaccine-related cardiac arrest about two months after taking the Janssen vaccine. Cardiac arrest in Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. And uh, fortunately, the miracle of his case is they called 911 and the paramedics happened to be at the gate next door just by chance. So they ran over to the jetway and it took three efforts at defibrillation, but he was defibrillated. He was in VF and uh, he came back, no neurologic damage. He has an ICD in uh, and he survived vaccine-induced cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people have asked me, they say, well, if someone collapses, if someone goes into one of these um, abnormal rhythms, it's very obvious there's a problem with the heart and we've started looking at the heart. But do you think it's possible because of the systemic distribution of the vaccine and therefore the systemic distribution of the spike protein 
that there could be similar other inflammatory processes going on in other parts of the body as well as the heart it's just that we haven't picked them up yet thinking maybe particularly about the uh, the liver perhaps the kidneys and and of course the ovaries and testes are, are a lot of concern yeah i'll let nick answer that because we have a larger study uh this is the myocarditis substat or a larger autopsy study nick do you want to take that on about kind of multi-organ system involvement sure sure yeah so so the other paper we or the other study we conducted um, still hasn't been published. It's on the preprint server of, of Zenodo. But in that paper, we actually looked at all the autopsy case studies or case series uh, that include COVID-19 vaccines as a uh, previous exposure. And so in, in that study, we actually found, yes, the cardiovascular system was, was the most frequently implicated among the cases, among the 325 autopsy cases that were included. Uh, but that was followed by hematological system cases, respiratory system, and multi-system involvement. Um, so, so, so in that study, uh, it was kind of 50% or so was cardiovascular, but the rest was, was distributed uh, throughout the body. Um, now, um, Dr. McCullough, you want to talk about the mechanisms behind any possible hematological? Right. So the, the hematological fatal syndromes that are in the, the larger studies on the European Commission's Zenodo server uh, include uh, fatal uh, pulmonary embolism, venous, thromb uh, venous thromboembolism. I think people would accept that. But also vaccine-induced thrombocytopenic thromb uh, purpurea. Mm -hmm. in, other, in, in other words, the... The platelets aren't working, and the blood doesn't clot properly, and you kind of get bruises all over the place as a result of that. Yeah, well, well you know, it's interesting. It, it happened largely with the adenoviral vaccines, AstraZeneca and Janssen. Okay. So there's actually abnormal clotting and bleeding at the same time. The, mm. the final mechanism of death in those cases is typically intracranial hemorrhage and thrombosis. But I suppose if someone's blood was clotting, it would be using up the clotting factors and the blood would be having difficulty to clot after that. A bit, a bit, a bit like a sepsis, really, perhaps. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we found in both studies that was necessary is we, we actually extracted all of the autopsy data into evidence tables, and then we had to independently re review it with, uh, you know, experts who, in cardiac pathology. For the following reasons, Dr. Campbell, at the time the papers were published, some of these known mechan some of these mechanisms we know now, they weren't known back then. Yeah. So, you know, some of the earliest uh, autopsies were done in Germany. So a patient would take a vaccine and die of a pulmonary embolism. And the conclusion at the time is, well, it wasn't related to the vaccine because they simply didn't know. Didn't, yeah. yeah, but so we know now. So this, this idea, I think this is going to be true for a long time, that, that we really you can't just read the conclusions of the authors. We have to independently review the information ourselves with mm. contemporary understanding. Well, the, the review process, yeah, we, we had a fair review process, the reviewers. We had a method for tiebreakers. Uh, we did everything the right way. So, you know, this idea, when we do a review like this, we want to make sure there's no bias. So in selection of the papers, we followed, uh, you know, standard uh, methods, uh, Prisma search sessions. Uh, Nick produced a, a Prisma flow diagram. And then on the adjudication and review, we, we followed, again, standard methods to make sure it was, it was rigorous. Now, in the overall autopsy study, we found that 73.9% of cases, the vaccine was either directly the cause of death or significantly contributed to death. In the myocarditis paper that we're reviewing um, that's fully published, it was all the cases were due to the vaccine because you know they were, they were um, a priori thought to be cardiac myocarditis. Mm -hmm. This graphic here that's showing that uh, most of the fatal events occurred three days after the vaccine, going up to 36 days after the vaccine. Um, does this mean that people that were vaccinated a year ago can pretty well relax about this? We, sim we simply don't know, Dr. Campbell. This is just, you know, the days after the vaccine where the autopsies were performed. You know, in the United States, mm. 
Medical examiners don't order autopsies on all unexplained deaths. It's it's really a judgment call. Yeah. And I think here the proximity to the, the vaccine is what's driving this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so Nick, Nick you, use, you use something called the Bradford Hill Criteria in adjudication by expert cardiologists. Um, because all the people watching this or a lot of people are going to say, look, this is a correlation. It doesn't equal causality. How do we move from correlation to causality in, in this study? Right. Well, well, so the Bradford Hill criteria includes a, a few different categories, it includes strength, consistency, specificity, temporality. So so we'll start with we'll start with mm-hmm. strength of the evidence. So, I mean, the, the evidence is pretty strong. We, we have uh, biopsies autopsies that are showing uh, spike protein directly within the affected mm-hmm. tissues uh, and, and there's there's hundreds and hundreds of studies that uh, support the idea that, uh, that, that that vaccines can cause certain syndromes such as myocarditis so so I mean th- th- there's a really large amount of strength to, to the association and the consistency seen well there's a high, really high degree of consistency um, yeah, there's, there's 28 cases of fatal myocarditis that, that we found, but um, overall, there's thousands, if not uh, tens of thousands of cases of myocarditis from the vaccine. Um, so, and every study has the same findings over and over again, consistency. So that's important. Specificity. Um, yeah, it, it's very specific. Uh, we found spike protein. Uh, inside the cardiomyocytes and those with with COVID-19 vaccine induced myocarditis. Um, Temporality, uh, as this this graphic Mm -hmm. here shows, um, there was a very strong temporal correlation between the COVID-19 vaccines uh, and death from myocarditis. Um, I mean, especially since the mean age of death was around less than a week. and, and biological plausibility again that goes back into you know is it plausible is this can the COVID nineteen vaccines is there a mechanism that can cause the death and uh, we talked about that earlier there's many many different possible reasons that could contribute to death and uh, coherence is the is the data coherent uh, you know. Are there major differences between these deaths? Uh, you know, that doesn't make sense. And, and yes, yes, um, we see very consistent findings uh, with with each case, um, and, and that was outlined. Um, that, that's what we looked at previously. Mm-hmm. So all in all, um, the Bradford Hill criteria seems to have met the criteria for causality for COVID-19 vaccines contributing to death. Um, but uh, we can't we can't 100% say, yeah, there's a causal link. Um, we, we just can't say that as researchers until we have a massive amount of evidence. But we, we can say there's a, there's a very high likelihood. Mm-hmm. Dr. McCullough, would it be inappropriate to speculate the proportion of the excess deaths that we're currently suffering from at the moment are attributable to this, or is that a completely unreasonable question? We need a lot more studies. You know, I think what's really needed, which would be very helpful for temporal association, is I think all countries should merge the vaccine administration data and the death data. And, you know, a lot of countries have this. It's simply merging, and if we saw spikes... Uh, temporally associated with when when people took the vaccines, we could we could zero in on these deaths. Uh, Dr. Campbell, you know, in the United States, our CDC VAERS system indicates that we've had about 18,000 Americans mm. uh, who have died and people report them to VAERS. I've made these reports as a doctor. I made a VAERS mm. report today, um, so I'm very familiar on how to do it. 18,000 where we think the vaccine caused the death. Okay, so it's so this is highly selected for we we think causality is there. Do you know of those eighteen thousand plus? Do you know eleven fifty occurred on the same day they took the shot, sometime right in the vaccine center, and then another twelve hundred is the next day afterwards. So even if we draw a very close time stamp here, we're looking at thirty days here. I can tell you if this was a drug trial. And I was chairing the Data Safety Monitor Board, which I've done 
about two dozen times in my career, we would say, listen, anything within 30 days, any event is attributed to the experimental product, period. It's mm. just a regulatory standard. And yet strange that this hasn't been done. Um, I don't, do, sh do, should we make a comment on why this isn't being done? Have we any ideas why this data is not being taken up and waived strongly by governments and regulatory bodies around the world? Or do you want to pass on that one? It's impossible to assign, assign motive, but none of the regulatory agencies have done a detailed evaluation of death after the vaccine. There's been no investigation uh, by any yeah. country. But clearly, we, we're calling for that now. I mean, this, this yeah. should be done as a matter of urgency. Right. Gentlemen, thank you very much for that fascinating insight. We'll publish this with all the links. Um, I'm afraid I can't guarantee how this will be accepted by uh, various uh, video platforms, but uh, the attempt will be a noble one. So uh, for your time and, uh, and all the huge amount of work and, 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 and what you're doing generally in promoting health and well-being and uh, bringing to light things that otherwise would be hidden uh, on, on behalf of many, many people. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for having us.